Good morning. It's an honor to have you here. Hey, my name is Drake. I'm the pastor here. So excited to be gathering with you on Father's Day. Everyone's got a father in the room somewhere, right? And uh, so you can probably shoot him a text. And well, I realize, like, you know, when we get around holidays like this, Father's Day is not always a great day to celebrate for everyone. And so I uh, realized that, man, this might be a hard day for you. Uh, maybe you've had loss or maybe you didn't have a dad growing up. Um, and so today, man, I hope that today's message is going to be encouraging to you as we talk about God's heart as a father. Um, so a couple of things. Hey, if you're online joining us, thanks so much. It's an honor to have you. You can use all the digital res- resources to connect with us as well, just like Emily was talking about. Hey, can you put your hands together for Emily crushing that welcome? So good. And for Daniel leading us in solo worship today. Super cool. Um, it's really an honor to gather with you. So, so a couple of things as we get into it. We're in this new series. Um, hey, by the way, you guys cold? Anybody cold in the room? It's dark in here, so I can't see. Anybody cold? Raise your hand. Everybody's good. We're halfway cold. Okay. Hey, if you guys will watch it. We got like... It's summer, right? And so it kind of goes in, like up and down. You can't ever get the temperature just right. And so sometimes you're freezing and sometimes you're sweating. I don't know which one I'd rather be. Probably freezing up here, but maybe sweating where you're sitting. I don't know what's better. But hey, again, it's an honor to have you. Um, as we're in this series, we're going through the book of First John, okay? So you might not know anything about the Bible, and that's okay. I'll kind of give you just a big picture of where we're going. John is quite possibly Jesus' best and closest friend on the planet while he was walking the earth. And so Jesus, we, we talked about it kind of kicking off this series. He loved all people, but he was close with a few people. He had what, what are normally referred to as the 12 disciples and kind of his 12 closest guys. And in that, he had three other guys that were even closer, kind of his like immediate circle. You probably have that too, right? You got friends and then you got like people that really know you. And then there was John. And John was quite possibly Jesus' best and closest Friend, And so now we're diving into one of the letters. John wrote four letters in the New Testament, and, uh, uh, and we love to learn from John. But, but we, t- we started talking about, man, what would it look like to lean in? John is an older man. He's probably uh, between 80 and 100 years old as he writes the letter that we're digging into today. And periodically here at City Church, we go back and forth. We'll do like a topical series talking about, uh, um, you know, maybe specific things going on in life. Like we talked about mental and emotional health um, in our last series. And then every now and then we'll transition to a whole book study. And what we do in, in these, and we'll do this through the whole summer for like 13 weeks, we're literally going verse by verse through the book of 1 John, and, and here's why. First of all, uh, um, it teaches us how to read the Bible so that we're not just, you know, uh, you probably have seen or heard of people who take the Bible, take it out of context, use it to, uh, you know, misuse it and abuse it and hurt other people. You guys familiar with that, right, where we can just kind of cut and paste and make the Bible say what you want it to say? Well, we don't, we don't have to do that. We shouldn't do that. And so this is going to teach us how to properly dig into the Bible for ourselves and make sure that we're actually reading it in the way that it's meant to be read. But in addition, as we walk through a book, it allows us, or rather, it makes us deal with what's in front of us. And so sometimes, you know, you get to stuff in the Bible and it's weird or it's awkward or it's challenging or, or you know, and you're like, oh, let's just kind of skip over that. Well, when we do a book study, we don't get to do that. <laughs> okay, so we just got to kind of walk through it. So as we kick off today, true or false, let me ask you this question. True or false? How a conversation starts often determines how it's going to end. Probably true, right? So, so I'll give you an example. Uh, Danielle and I, Danielle's my wife. Um, we've been married for 10 years, and one of us, I'm not going to say who it is, okay, but one of us tends to start conversations kind of like, you know, sandpaper. <laughs> you know, one of us tends to come off just a little bit, you know, rough around the edges at times, and, and over 10 years, this, this one of us is getting better at it, but uh, okay, the one of us is me, right? You know that, um, right? One of us has a tendency to start conversations poorly, um, and so yesterday, it's a great example. Um, I, I like to say often, especially if, if you're a follower of Jesus, you ever met like someone who's following Jesus, and they just look like the most miserable person on the planet? You know what I'm talking about? Like, they just like, look like following Jesus is the worst thing that's ever happened to them, and so for them, I'm like, man, like if you're happy and you know it, Tell your face, <laughs> okay? If you're happy and you know it, tell your face. Well, yesterday, I, I was on the phone with Danielle. She was out running errands with the kids, and um, I was at home, and I called her, and I was totally like, like, there was no sandpaper, okay? We were just totally good, and I was just calling to check in, but apparently my tone didn't necessarily communicate that everything was okay. And so then Danielle heard sandpaper, and she's like, why are you, why are you being rude? And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not being rude. I'm... I'm, to- I'm great. I'm gravy over here. We're, we're totally fine. And then we had this whole dialogue about how I, how I came across. And then she, she was like, you know how you always say, if you're happy and you know it, tell your face? Well, maybe you should think about, if you're happy and you know it, tell your tone. <laughs> I was like, okay. 
I will work on that, right? How a conversation starts often determines how it ends. Um, and so today it's Father's Day. So as we dig into the text, what you're going to find is actually there's some really helpful parenting advice that's been really beneficial to me today. So you're going to find that today. Um, but, but in addition, um, John's going to be pointing us to God's heart, specifically as a father. And so let, let, me, let me throw up this, this how, how uh, John enters this conversation. My little children. How's that sound? That's pretty soft, isn't it? Like, like, that's not aggressive, it's not, you know, up in your face, it's not, you know, rubbing you the wrong way. It kind of sounds like, like a, a really tender father or almost like a grandpa, right? right? I was just talking to Sue Lee, if you haven't met him, he's back here, he and his wife's son. Um, um, he teaches Taekwondo, he's 80 years old, and he's like the most awesome grandpa ninja I've ever met. Um, and, and he was asking me how many kids we have on a Sunday morning. And I was like, well, well, like, I don't know, somewhere around like 20 or something like that. Why? And he's like, because I want to bring them all ice cream. And I was like... You're, you're such a suck up. Like, you're the best grandpa on the planet. That's so amazing. Like, he knows how, how to, like, you know, get in good with the kids. He just wants to bring them all ice cream. And, and, and so, right, John, as an older man, if you, if you missed the first end of the series, um, he, he did not start out tender. Right? His nickname was, uh, with his brother, the Sons of Thunder. Right? And that wasn't a compliment. I mean, he was like brash and aggressive and like, like just, just all over the place. And so slowly as he walks with Jesus, what we see is Jesus changes his life. And so now as an older man, 80, 100 years old, he's writing to uh, early Christians um, who are being discouraged and disillusioned in their faith. And he is trying to encourage them. And, and what we're going to see today is he's going to bring some correction. Um, and, and so, again, how you start probably determines how it ends. You guys with me? And I realize, like, as you're in here, some of you are followers of Jesus. Some of you have been following Jesus for a long time. Some of you have never uh, made the decision to start following Jesus. You're kind of skeptical of faith, or maybe you stayed away from faith, or you stepped back from faith, or maybe you grew up in and around faith, but you're not sure what that means for you. I, I realize we have lots of different spiritual journeys in the room, and so sometimes when we get into, like, not feel-good conversations, especially when it comes to the Bible, right, we either check out, or we get offended, or we just leave. And so I want you to see John's heart here, Kind of as this like elder father in the faith or like as, as a grandpa, he's like my little children. He's starting soft because he's got some things to say that if they're not received in the right way can, can really mess up where, where we're headed. Does it make sense to you guys? Right? You, you ever had something true said to you in the wrong way and you didn't receive it well? Right? That's the conversation today. Today there's going to be some truth that you and I can embrace, but... If we receive it the wrong way, then we probably can't take it to heart, and it probably won't help us. Here's what I want you to hear, and I love you. I'm for you. I know I'm setting it up like, man, this is going to come down like a hammer. It's not that bad, okay? It's not, it's not as bad as it could be, but it is some really helpful stuff that I think is going to point us in the right direction. So here's the first thing. I want to give you this big point, point. and if you're taking notes, this is for you, okay? God is going to tell you who you are before he tells you what to do. This is so important. It's Father's Day, right? And, and it's the heart of a father that God carries when it comes to our relationship with him. And so some of you have been presented with this idea of God in a religious fashion. And what I want you to understand is that for God, connection precedes correction. Right? There are some things that we need to grow in. There are some things that need to change. There are some things that we need to, to maybe stop doing or start doing or, or grow in. But the motive and where it starts matters so much more than just the, the thing that needs to change itself. And so little ch children, right? This is, a, this is not a hard startup. And so um, here's what that means. If you're a follower of Jesus in the room, you and I, we, we don't work for our identity, but rather we live from our identity. Does this make sense to you? Right? That, that who God says that I am then empowers me to live a certain way. So some of you, you, th you think God is like this. And this is important because man, if you've grown up around this, if you've been exposed to this, if you heard this from someone else, you experienced this from someone else, and this is your idea of Jesus and this is your idea of God, first of all, I'd like to extend an apology. Right? Like, right, wherever you, like, I've, I've not always got it right by any means um, since I started following Jesus at 15. But if, but if you've received this idea of God that is inconsistent with who Jesus showed us uh, who he is, um, and it's negatively impacted you or maybe turned you away, man, I'd I just like to extend an apology first, but also just to bring you back into maybe that, that was an experience inconsistent with what Jesus wants you to understand about who God is. And, and so, so some of you, you hear this invitation into a relationship with God. It sounds like this. Do these things, and then I'll love you. And some of you grew up in homes like this. 
And, and that's why we struggle. Some, we, we can't help but, but attach some of our growing up and our parenting to our idea of God. And so some of you grew up in homes where, where the only favor you received was based on your performance. Do these things, and I will love you. And it's, and it's in a, a relationship built around performance. And, and do this to please me and earn my favor, earn my love. And that's not the invitation from Jesus. It's not the invitation from God. But rather, as a follower of Jesus, God says, I love you, and I'm going to help you do these things. It's not absent of right living. It's not absent of what's good for you. It's not absent of correction. But rather, it's I love you, and I'm going to walk with you and help you. And so then you operate and you live your life out of a place of being loved and being served and being helped by God rather than trying to earn his favor by the way that you live. Does this make sense to you guys? Right? You, see, you see how, man, different these paradigms can affect the way that you live? I mean, I mean it could be so crushing if, if we get this wrong. And so the motive matters. So, so when we approach the Bible and when, as we're, we're digging into this letter from John, we, we have two options today, and I'm just going to kind of set it up, okay? We can come at it at, in, in confrontation, or we can receive it as an invitation. Does this make sense? Right? When, when things get a little hard, we, we, we can fight against God, or we can realize his heart and receive it as an invitation. That I can fight against what God is inviting me into, or I can receive it because he's a good dad who loves me. So I have, a little, I have two little boys, Grayson and Asher. They're five and three. Um, and we, we live, like, on a busy street, so we play behind our house a lot. Um, and if we're ever out front, you know, they'll play with balls or whatever, and it's kind of dangerous. It kind of freaks me out. There's a really busy road. And so they're not allowed to play in the street. Right? It's a pretty good rule for little kids, right? You guys agree? Anyone like, man, you're just such a terrible dad. I can't believe you don't let your kids play in the street. Right? No. Right? We all understand why. Why can't they play in the street? You know what? Sometimes because they don't quite understand my motive, right? They're like, oh, dad, you are such a fun sucker. All the fun stuff is out in the middle of that street. It's not any fun right here in the grass. It's fun out there, right? That, that, and, and we know that, and the reality is I just love them. I just don't want you to be a pancake, right? I don't want you to get hit by a bus or, or run over by a biker. Like, like, it's not safe for you out there. And so sometimes we might not, might not understand God's invitation or his commands or his correction, but if we can understand the heart, we can, we can receive it a little better. Does this make sense? So is it possible? I mean, I'm just you know, throwing it out there. Is it possible that you and God won't always agree on everything? I, I mean, there's a good chance that you and God aren't always going to see eye to eye. Now, can, I, can, can we just take a self-evaluation? Um, you know, who's, who's God in that picture, okay? <laughs> when there's a disagreement, there's probably somewhere we should defer. That's where we got to figure that out, okay? All right, now let's go to verse 1b. He, he started off, right, my little children? I'm writing these things to you so that, he gives us our purpose statement, you may not sin. <laughs> like right out of the box, you're like, oh, man, here it goes. There it is. I was actually thinking about it, right? We, we, we've had conversations. If you missed it, we did this series called Love First at the beginning of the year. You can catch it on our podcast or our YouTube channel. And we talked about the motive, right? Sin is the byproduct of, of us not being close in relationship with God, like, like that, that, that we sin because we don't love God. And our, that relationship's not being cultivated. But he doesn't start there, right? He says, I'm writing to you so that you won't Sin, and you're like, that's not, like, why not? I'm writing to you so that you, you know, you could love God more and more and more, right? That, that sounds better, right? Same, same byproduct, same, same fruit on the other side when I love God more and more, right? Listen, listen, if I love you, if I really love you, am I going to lie to you? The answer is no, because it's unloving. You with me? So when Jesus says to love God and people, the invitation is, by, by default, we, we, we're not going to sin, if I love you, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to murder. I'm not going to envy. I'm not. You, you see what I'm saying? Like, it's the antithesis of, of love. And so the same thing when, with, in our relationship with God, that love is actually the, the, the proper motive. So why doesn't he start there? Why does he start here? I'll remind you, okay? He's writing a letter, and there's literally people who are, are, are confusing these early Christians, and they're saying, hey, listen, Jesus is great, the church is great, but the reality is you, you don't really need Jesus. You don't need forgiveness. Sin's not really a problem. And there are these people that are saying, I love God with everything in me, and, and I just don't you know, listen to him or follow him or, or agree with anything he says. Right? That, that, that's the, that's the, the, the opposition that's happening in, in this early church and these early followers. Is there, there's this group of people that are teaching, hey, listen, you don't need Jesus. Sin is not a problem. And, and you and God are good. And you just be a good person. And, and you just do whatever you want. 
And John's like, actually, you know, that, that's not true. And so rather than starting with love, because there's tons of people that are saying, we love God, but they're not living like it. You ever been irritated with someone who says there's something and they don't live like it? Right? We call those people hypocrites. You're probably one of them, right? <laughs> At times, right? We all, we all get there. And so there's this huge division that he is addressing as he writes to encourage the early church. So let me ask you a question. What's your background? You might not like this word, okay? I'm, I'm going to give you some definitions here in a minute. That's okay. Um, but, but what's your background when it comes to, to the idea of sin? And you might have not grown up in a church. Like, I didn't grow up in the church, so we didn't talk about sin in, in the home like, like in, in, the, in a formal sense, okay? But like, what about for you? Did you grow up in a home that was like, like too permissive? Like, like, like it was just all grace all the time, no correction, no, no structure, no help? Or did you grow, grow up in a home that was like too punitive? Like just constantly bringing the hammer down, right? Sins and mistakes were thrown into the same category, and it was just like constant pressure to have your act together, right? We have different backgrounds. Let me give you some just parenting advice and some real life advice, okay? There's a big difference between a sin and a mistake. You guys with me? There's a big difference between sin that he's going to talk about here and a mistake. Here's, let me give you a definition. If you're writing things down, this is really important. A sin is anything in motive, thought, or action, okay? So, so it goes deeper than just what's happening with our hands. Sin is anything against the word of God, the will of God, or the way of God. Sin is anything against the word of God, black and white, in the scriptures. The will of God, meaning sometimes God is going to say something's not good for you, and that might not be true for other people. Okay, for example, right now I don't have Instagram or Facebook on my phone because God said I don't need those things right now. <laughs> okay, it's not a sin necessarily for you, but because God told me to remove it, right, it would be if I chose not to obey. Does that make sense to you? The word of God, the will of God, and the way of God, the, the things that we see modeled in the life of Jesus, okay? That, that's where sin falls in. A mistake is very simply how we learn. How ridiculous would it be if as a father, when, when Grayson started to walk for the first time, right, we're all celebrating, he's standing up and doing the wobble, you know what I'm saying, and then he takes that first step, and we're like, woohoo, and then he falls, and then I just lose it. You're such a pathetic son. You're, you, sh you should have had it together, by right? That's ridiculous, and you know it, because mistakes are how we learn. Some of you grew up in, in, in homes where mistakes and, and sins weren't, weren't separated, and some of you have a really hard time separating them yourselves. So let me give you an example. Um, Grayson, my, my oldest, uh, and, and Asher, they're both in Taekwondo. And, um, and they're doing great. Like, they're learning. And, and they had their, like, final test this last week. And Asher, like, they, they both, like, could make three mistakes in their final test. If they, made, if they didn't make mistakes, then they uh, got their little patch along with their belt, okay? So Asher does it, and he makes, like, one or two mistakes, and he passes. And so then Grayson gets up, and he does it, and he makes more than three mistakes, and he doesn't get his patch, and he's five, right? So he doesn't have a, a, an idea of, like, this is, this is the first time ever. And he comes back, and then he, like, you can see it in his mind. He's like, why didn't I get a patch? <laughs> right? And then we have a conversation. And then all of a sudden, he gets a little sad. He gets bummed out. And he comes to me, and he talks to me. And I, and I say, hey, man, listen. You made more mistakes than, than, than you were supposed to make. So, so you got to practice, right? You weren't paying attention. And we talked about it, right? We talked ahead of time, before, all, both, both sides. Hey, you got to practice so you get it right so that you can pass the test. And he didn't pass, and he was super bummed, right? But I didn't call him a failure and tell him that he, right? It was just a mistake. That wasn't a sin. He just didn't practice. And so I was able to encourage him. Hey, man, listen, you just got to put the practice in, and then you can pass next time, right? And he had this moment of learning for the first time ever as a five-year-old that what I put, is, put in is sometimes what I receive, right? And this is true across the board. And so that wasn't like a, um, th this thing to, to bring the hammer down on him. It was a bummer. I was bummed for him. Right? But, but there wasn't just a participation trophy either, right? There was something that he had to learn from that. That if, he, if he's in the back of the class goofing off, then he, he didn't pass. Right? That was good for him, right? You guys with me? Some of you are like, no, it's not good. It's okay. I know. You, your, your feelings are sensitive and you have a hard time. It's okay. All right. So, so the other side, let me give you an example too. We're at a birthday party yesterday. I know this is a lot, but I'm, I'm really trying to get the heart of it here, okay? We're at a birthday party and uh, we did a scavenger hunt and they all go get toys. And there's this one toy that Grayson really wanted to find. And he didn't find it. There was only two of them. So odds weren't great. And, uh, and so he was, he was bummed. And that's okay, right? You can be bummed that you didn't get it. But then his bum turned into like this, this selfish little fit. And he started to cry. And he started to whine. 
and he started to make a really big deal about not finding that toy, right? So at first we're talking to him, but then we're about to sing happy birthday to these little girls, and instead of being present and celebrating, right, it's not his birthday, we're having this conversation, he, he is making the decision to make it all about himself, he's being selfish, and he's crying and, and taking away from, like, us celebrating them in the middle of that, so I have, to, I have to remove him from the scene, we go down the alley, sit on the table, and we have an entire conversation, but hey, man, you're being really selfish right now, this is not your birthday party, this is not about you, we're here to celebrate our friends, you guys with me, you guys agree? This, right, this is not right. I didn't bring the hammer down. I didn't, I didn't just, you, like, I wasn't mean to him. But as a father heart, he needed a correction in that moment because that selfishness is going to get in the way of him having longevity and friendships. You guys understand that, right? This is not because I'm a mean dad and he, and he deserves that toy, right? No, he needs to understand that loving people means putting them first. You guys get this, right? So that's John's heart today as he has this conversation, that you won't sin. Because sin is going to hurt us, it's going to hurt others, and it, and it breaks the heart of God. But check this out. If anyone does sin, woo! <laughs> Glad that's in there. Anybody else? Yeah, okay, cool. I was wondering, because I was really worried for a minute if we, there was any hope, because I am screwed, right? Like, if anyone does sin, check this out. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. Big word, big word. You're going to get what you pay for today, okay? Um, he's the propitiation for our sins. That was a joke. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay, you know when you're on a family road trip, and like you're looking out the window, and you like see stuff, and you're like, oh, look, oh, look. You're, you know what I'm talking about? And then every now and then you drive by something that's worth like getting out of the car and looking at. You guys know what I'm talking about? And so you get out and look around. Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get out of the car, and we're going to look around. There's three words here that I want to sit on and teach you today that I think are going to breathe a lot of life into you when it comes to God's heart for you and for us. So the first one is going to be this word advocate. Advocate. He says that, hey, if, if we do struggle with sin, which is like everybody, okay, just in case you're wondering, none of us are perfect, don't have all of our stuff together. Well, what John is saying is, hey, if we do, we need Jesus, right? That, that's the answer to our problems. And so Jesus is first our advocate. This word means literally a helper or representative. This is like court language. I don't know if you've ever been in court, uh, um, but you know, maybe you watched you know, some TV and you watched court scenes play out or whatever. And so this is court language of an advocate on your behalf. Jesus referred to the devil as the accuser over your life, the accuser, okay? And so this is like throwing blame, throwing shame, throwing guilt, and, and Jesus comes in as our advocate. So, okay, he, he, imagine the scenario. You, you're, you're in the courtroom, and, and God's the judge. God is Father is judge. Jesus is standing next to you as representative, and the devil's over here ready to blame you and throw all the shame and guilt. And the devil's going to go, well, they did this and this and this and this and this, and they said this and they thought this and their motive was this and they did that and they didn't do that and they should have helped them, right? And all, they're just going to lay it out, right? And Jesus is going to be like, yeah, okay, they did do that. <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that, that happened. I mean, you're stretching it a little bit, but okay, they, they did say that. Yeah, okay, they, they did do that. And, and, and the judgment is guilty. Guilty. But then Jesus steps in and says, but I'll take their place. I'll take the punishment. That, that, that's what an advocate does in this moment. Jesus acknowledges sin, has to be dealt with, right? Can't ignore it. But he steps in and says, I'll take their place. Here's what this means. Um, when, when Jesus looks at you and I, because he took on our shame and our guilt, you and I are not guilty. And some of you, you, you have tender consciences and you, you, you've been in scenarios where, where you just le re relive like the worst moments of your life over and over again. You relive mistakes, you relive regret, you relive shame and sin and what's been done to you, what you have done, and you, you go back and forth over and over again. And Jesus says, no, listen, it's case dismissed. I took the penalty, you're forgiven, it's over. Leave that behind. Let, let's, let's just move forward, right? That, that's the invitation from Jesus. It acknowledges guilt and then deals with it. And, 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 and this invitation is, is man, listen, listen, if, if you don't receive this from Jesus in the right way, then what you do is you, you're constantly robbed of, of joy and freedom. You live a guilt and a shame-ridden life. And Jesus says, listen, I already paid for it. It's already been dealt with. So let's move forward. 
That's, that's what he does as an advocate. The second word here is righteous. With the Father, Jesus is the righteous one. What that means is he's literally without sin, okay? So you and I can't claim that. You and I, and it's okay if you don't like that word, right? Uh, but, but if it's inconsistent, if you make mistakes, or you know, you and I are probably a little more than mistakers, <laughs> right? But we got some stuff that's, that's not always loving and not always right, and, and Jesus is going to call it sin. But then we see Jesus come in as the right, the one without sin. No sin whatsoever. And, and the reason it's so important is because he has the ability to stand in our place like you and I can't. But watch this. This is really, really important. The last word here is propitiation. It's a big word, right? You guys with me? Propitiation, okay? It literally means like, like substitution. Or, or th- this is referring to the death of Jesus in our place for our sins. This is the substitution of Jesus in our place. So here, let me just give you some big stuff. Again, John started with a tender, loving heart because he's trying to deliver some hard truth that sometimes, like, it's a little bit offensive. It's okay that it's offensive, but, but he wants to, us to receive it in the right way. So, so a couple of things, okay? God is holy without sin, separate from sin. He's holy, just, and righteous. And you and I, we have this sin problem And so you have this tension. If God is holy and he's just, God hates sin and he loves people. If God is holy and just, he has to deal with sin, but he still loves people. So so let me ask you a question. How how do you deal with sin? How do you you deal with the, the justice factor? He's got to be just. He's got to be holy. How do you deal with that while still loving and preserving the person? And the answer for God was Jesus The object of God's justice was either going to be on you and I, or it was on Jesus. And that's where Jesus steps in as our propitiation, our substitution. Jesus steps in our place for our sins. He dies the death that we deserve. He raises from the grave like you and I can't to offer us new life and relationship with God. Because, listen, this is amazing. God loved us first. We don't earn this. We don't deserve this. God is the initiator in this relationship. He's not only the judge, but then he's also bringing the payment. I mean, this is amazing. Love of God for you and I. And, and so let, let me help you understand, because, because sometimes we get really weird about this, right? God hates sin. God can't hate. I thought he was love, right? Listen, listen. You hate sin. You hate sin. Let me, let me give you some examples. You hear, you hear uh, of someone who was assaulted, and what do you say? And I hate that, don't you? You hear of a kid that was abused. What do you say? I hate we see a shooting happen in our city, and we see a, a, a people just wrongfully murdered and, and, and a cop die. What do you say? I hate that. You hate sin. The difference is you and I pick and choose which ones we hate more. <laughs> and so God is just, and he can lovingly deal with sin at the same time. So, so if, if, if our sin is bringing God's justice, the, the, here's where we get stuck. We, we, we want to come to God as like this self-help co- counselor. Like he's just going to give us a pat on the back and some good advice, and then we're going to be able to kind of go on with our day, right? And the reality is you and I are not good with God until Jesus enters the picture. Sin is a real problem that really has to be dealt with, and he dealt with it through Jesus. Now, so Jesus takes our place, and he gives us his place. Does this make sense to you guys? This is amazing. It's more than just like, hey, it's paid for. Go live your life. This is, God is, listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, God is not angry with you. He's not punishing you because he punished Jesus for you, right? God, God literally made his enemies his family. That's the invitation that you and I have. It, Jesus takes on our sin, and we receive forgiveness, this is why it's such good news, guys. The good news, it's over and over again. Jesus is there's constantly this reference. Good news, good news. Why? It's such good news because there is bad news. It wouldn't be good news if there was, right? If, if we just remove the whole sin problem, there's no reason for Jesus to die. This is really, really important. So I, I need to give you this picture. Daniel, why don't you come wherever you are? Um, I'm going to give you this picture. Jesus is hanging on a cross. You might be familiar with the scene, but let me give it to you, okay? He's dying for the sins of the world. His hands and feet are pierced. He's hanging there. And then Roman soldiers put a sponge on a spear, and they press it to his lips. You guys familiar with the scene? You heard of this maybe a little bit? I, I used to read that, and I was like, well, that's really nice of those guys. Like, as, as, I mean, you know, it's relative, but like, they're giving him a drink in the middle of, you know, hanging there, dying for the sins of the world. And I was doing some studying this week, and you know what I found out? This is horrifying. The sponge that they would have stuck on that spear and pressed to Jesus' lips, that, that would have been standard issue toilet paper for the Roman army. They were all equipped with a sponge, 
and vinegar as a disinfectant for their toilet paper on deployment. And so they, they would have taken their toilet paper sponge, put it on the end of a spear, and pressed it to Jesus' mouth. How, how insulting, right? How, how absolutely horrifying. And in that moment, you, you know what would come out of me? Rage. Wrath. I mean, I mean anything that I, I, right, I got a lot of responses and none of them look like Jesus. You know what comes out of Jesus in that moment? In the middle of just an incredibly insulting gesture. Toilet paper. Use toilet paper to his mouth. You know what comes out of Jesus? Love. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's the propitiation, the substitute for our sins. And not only for us, but for the whole world. Anyone in the whole world who turns to Jesus, doesn't matter what they've done, where they've been, what they're thinking, what they're doing, what they will do, what they will think. Anyone in the whole world who turns to Jesus and from sin can be completely forgiven and made new. This is the good news. This is what John's trying to get across. I'm writing to you. And listen, listen. This is an invitation to walk with Jesus. I don't have time to go into the rest of the text today. This is an invitation to walk with him. John's going to use that language over and over again. Walk with Jesus. Why? Listen, because when you give your life to Jesus, you're not made perfect. You're made new. The old has passed away. Jesus makes you new. And what, and what we're looking for, what Jesus is looking for is not perfection, but when you and I trust in Jesus, what Jesus is going to start to develop in you is progress. You see, when you give your life to Jesus, you're not going to be sinless like Jesus was. Not, not on this side of eternity. But when you walk with Jesus, you can sin less. This make sense? It's walking with Jesus. So you say, what about the struggle? What do I do with the struggle? Right, like when I'm not perfect and I'm in that progress moment. Listen, we're, we're, we're in city groups right now and um, one of the things we're working on right now is to share your story. So I want you to think about your story right now. We, we give three paradigms for the story. What, what was your life like before Jesus? How or when did you meet Jesus and begin to trust in him? Ask him to save you and set you free. And then what has your life been like since you started following Jesus? And what John's going to tell us is that you can't meet Jesus and not change. You, you can't meet Jesus and not change. That's, that's the big problem. All these people, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, I just don't want to obey him or follow him or I don't think he's right about a lot of stuff, but I love him. John said, listen, you can't meet Jesus and not change. But, but the difference is not, not where are you perfect, but what has made progress. I was meeting somebody with somebody this week and, and they were really discouraged about their story. Because they were like, man, I, I didn't have this big monumental, you know, I was like a, you know, a drug addict at five and I was, you know, dealing dope at eight and, you know, I was a heroin addict at 10 and then Jesus saved me, right? Like, right, they didn't have that story. And so they're like, I don't have this big monumental moment when Jesus changed my life, but I have a moment when I, when I, I remember like asking him to save me and asking him to forgive me. And it's just been this slow walk with Jesus ever since then, since a young age. And I said, listen, listen, you, know, you don't have to have this like crazy, huge moment, like moment in time of Jesus changing everything. Some people have that story. It's awesome. But I said, man, look, look, look back over the last 10 years of your life. And what's different because of Jesus? Odds are a lot of things. Because you can't meet Jesus and not change. And he loves you too much to leave you where you are. So here's what we're going to do. As we close our time together, I just want you to reflect on your personal story. Where are you today in that journey? What's your life been like before Jesus? 
have you ever met Jesus? And, and what I mean by that is, has, has there ever been a moment in your life where you, where you realize like there's this disconnect between you and God? Jesus dealt with the sin problem in your place and you asked for forgiveness. Jesus, I trust in you. I believe you're God. I believe that you died for my sin and my place rose again so that I could be made right with God and be in relationship with you. Has there been a moment in your life where you said, Jesus, I trust in you? You don't have to have all the fancy words or any of that. Just, Jesus, I need you. I trust in you. If you've never had that moment in your story, can I just encourage you? God loves you. And, and he sent Jesus to die for you to remedy that singular problem to make us right with God. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And then since then, evaluate, man, what, what progress have I seen in my life? Here's the deal. Listen, listen. Here at City Church, we are committed to helping you see progress. Not perfection, but that you would grow in your relationship with God and you would grow in your relationship with others. You would grow in what God is doing in and through your life and the world around you. Honestly, if God gives you six months here or six years here, that you would look back and say, holy cow, I am closer to Jesus than I have ever been in my life. And I am closer in community than I've ever been in my life. And I'm more on mission with Jesus in loving and serving those who are not in the family of God yet than I've ever been in my life. That's our goal for you. So what mistakes are you beating yourself up on? What is it that you're, you, you just have let just slam you over and over again and Jesus is saying, hey, that's, just leave it there. What sins are you struggling with over and over again and Jesus is saying, hey, listen, I died for it. Can we just, can we move on? You don't have to beat yourself up for it. I was already beat up for it. What is it that maybe right now um, God has been working on you, in you, through you on? And you're just struggling to trust him, struggling to take that step of faith, struggling to say yes, struggling to give that up, struggling to move in that direction. Maybe today is a moment where you let the right motive move you in that direction, that God loves you. He's a father and he has what's best for you. Will you bow your heads with me? We're going to pray together. As, as you close your eyes, this is just a moment of privacy for you, okay? Um, just to kind of reflect on what God is doing in your own life. So God, right now, we just come to you and say, hey, we, we need you. Jesus, we need you just as much today as we did yesterday. Thank you for dying in our place for our sins to make us new. Thank you for, for offering to, to rewrite our stories. And I pray for any of my friends in the room right now who have never said yes to you, that today they would make the decision. Just say, Jesus, I trust you. I need you to save me and set me free, and I want to walk with you. For those that have never made that decision, God, today would they, would they lean in and receive that incredible gift of being saved and set free? And would they know today with confidence that their story has forever changed because of that singular response to your incredible love for them? And for those of us that are followers of you, God, would you give us discernment to see the difference between mistakes and sin? And to walk closely with you and, and, and to listen to your voice, to dig into your word, to spend time with you daily. And then when you tell us to do something, God, will we have the faith to trust you that it's good for us and it's good for others and it's honoring to you. God, if there's things that we need to leave behind, would you give us the courage to do that today? If there's things we need to embrace, would you give us the courage to step in that direction? If there's community that we need to invite into that space, if there's help that we need from the outside, would you give us the boldness to invite that into our lives? Jesus, we trust you and we're grateful that, that you love us. And we ask that you give us a vision for the life that we live every day of the week. That you want to work in and through us to share your love with the world. Amen. I'm going to ask my, uh, my communion team to come. You guys come on up. I won't break the bread today, but right now uh, we're going we're gonna to sing some songs and close out the service, and this is just a time of reflection for you. And so Faja and Craig, you guys go ahead and uh, move the tables. And during this next song, um, you guys are welcome to, as you're comfortable, to receive communion. Communion is just an opportunity we, we uh, gather together, and Jesus said, hey, when you gather, you're going to take the bread and the wine and, and, and do this in remembrance of me. And so as we take the bread and the wine, this is a moment where, where we remember Jesus' body broken for us and Jesus' blood shed for us. So if you're a follower of Jesus, I'm just going to invite you. You're welcome to come up at any time during this next song. They're going to serve you. You're going to take the bread. We have gluten-free and regular options, okay? And that you're going to take the bread, pick it up, dip it in the, the glass. We have wine in the larger glasses. 
and grape juice in the smaller ones, okay? So you have all the options, okay? And so you can come up, you're going to take the bread, uh, gluten-free or regular, dip it in the wine, and you'll take it back to your seat and take it when you're ready, okay? And then just, it might be a little loud in here, and so if you can't hear them, Fonja and Craig are going to say, his body broken for you and his blood shed for you. And so this is a moment when we take communion, we're remembering the sacrifice of Jesus for us, the love of God for us. And as we reflect on that, we let it move us in the proper direction because of motive, because of the Father heart of God. To, to quote the, the great theologian, Taylor Swift, don't, don't leave without this. It's a love story. Baby, just say yes, okay? That's the picture, man, of God's Father heart for you and I. If you're a follower of Jesus, remember. If you're not a follower of Jesus, say yes today. Thanks for joining us, guys. It's been an honor. Daniel's going to lead us in a song, and you guys come to take communion when you're ready, okay?